America. Only in 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 America. This week, we're continuing our discussions on welcoming Afghans to the United States. It doesn't surprise me that a retired major or colonel will offer bedrooms in his basement to a group of Afghans that he knows the father, you know, and he's going to give them a car to drive around in North Carolina and take them to the DMV and, you know, call an immigration lawyer to try to get them social security numbers and that sort of thing. I mean, I'm seeing that kind of thing happening. And I don't ordinarily see that sort of thing with other refugee groups. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani, and this is Only in America. These past few weeks, we've heard from some of the countless groups mobilizing to welcome newly arriving Afghan evacuees. This week, as we honor Veterans Day, we're going to take a closer look at how the military community has stepped up to the challenge of welcoming new arrivals, and how these connections, along with new legislation, can set Afghans up for success. As an expert in both immigration and military law, Margaret Stock has a unique expertise and perspective when it comes to Afghan evacuation and resettlement. She's one of the nation's top immigration lawyers and a retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve. Margaret has seen firsthand how urgent situations like the Afghan evacuation clash with our country's outdated, vertigo-inducing immigration maze, and she has some valuable insights. But first, let's find out how she ended up where she is today. At the same time that I was serving in the Army Reserve, at one point I decided I wanted to be a lawyer, and I've told this story in writing in various uh, law review articles and so forth, but I was going to be a tax lawyer originally. And then I, <clears throat> by accident, ended up taking an immigration law class in law school because my constitutional law class had been canceled because the professor quit. And the professor on the first day of immigration law class was starting to go into this rant about how crazy immigration law was and how crazy the agencies were and how they're always trying to you know, deport people and everything. And I, I was a government employee and I was sitting there thinking they can't be that bad. You know, they can't be that bad. And then about five years later, when I'd been practicing immigration law for a while, I, I agreed with her. I thought, yes, they're as bad as the professor said on that, that first day of class. But it was pure happenstance, Ollie. I happened to be an Army Reserve officer doing national security stuff. You know, I had top secret clearance and I was dealing with anti-terrorism and everything. And then I became an immigration lawyer by accident. As a professor foretold, the complexities of the immigration system are as haphazard as ever. It's very complicated, unfortunately. And this is a function of the fact that U.S. immigration law is very, very complicated. So the evacuees, the ones that are in the United States absolutely need to go see an immigration lawyer who's qualified to analyze their fact situation and figure out what their options are. I can run through a few of the typical options that I'm seeing, but I'm finding that a number of the evacuees turn out to be American citizens and they don't know it. And it takes an expert immigration lawyer to figure that out. And this is one of the things that the government uh, did not initially plan for was some way to screen all the folks coming into the United States for different types of uh, immigration benefits. They literally paroled everybody. So they paroled American citizens, they paroled people that had other means available, you know, green card holders sometimes got paroled. Another thing Margaret says the administration didn't plan for, well, the fact that many Afghans had strong ties to U.S. veterans, a community that refused to leave its allies behind. The number one email I think I get from somebody in the military these days, and it's been going on for a few years, is an email that says, I have a friend in Afghanistan that I want to help. And I get those every day. That's one thing I think the administration kind of missed in the initial planning was this is not a typical group of refugees fleeing from an earthquake or, you know, drought or climate change or whatever. This is a group of people who have very, very, very strong ties to the United States. And they didn't really take that into account. They should have realized last spring that there, there's going to be an outpouring of outrage if you leave these people behind. There's going to be a lot of people willing to step up that you wouldn't ordinarily see stepping up to help an incoming group of refugees because they, these folks have really, really strong ties to a lot of people within the military community. And the military traditionally looks out for each other. It's just an extraordinary moment. You know, the outpouring of support from veterans. 
right? Like I, you maybe saw the poll that we released with Blue Star families. So, I mean, like what struck me about that poll was not only, you know, do close to 80% of veterans um, support um, providing refuge to um, this, you know, to Afghan allies, but even more striking, almost 50% of them are already personally engaged in providing support to them in welcoming them. That was Nazanin Ash, CEO of Welcome.us. We'll hear more from Naz about Welcome's work in an upcoming episode. But as she mentioned, there's an incredible level of support for Afghan allies among the veteran community. Margaret also explained how the evacuation could change veterans' views on immigration more broadly. Well, I think it's that's starting to happen. I think there was... A- at some point in the past, you know, a sense among people in the military that we trust our government, you know, we we work for it, right? So we think our government knows what it's doing. And I think I'm hearing a lot more from people in the military community that the immigration system doesn't make any sense because they're now having to deal with it on behalf of one of their close friends or, you know, somebody that they really care about. And they didn't realize what a mess it was. You know, I hear somebody say something like, well, it's easy to get into the country on the southern border. But if you're an Afghan who worked for America, you know, it's a nightmare. Uh, And I have to kind of reset them on that and go, no, actually, you know, it's not easy to get into the United States on the southern border. I think you might have been reading wrong information in the news. And oh, by the way, you can't apply for asylum unless you walk up to the border and ask to apply for asylum. You know, there's no way to apply in Central America. And just like your friend can't apply right now who's stuck in Kabul. Um, So we're having those conversations, but I think it is the case that this experience has taught a lot of people that the immigration system is a mess. And I think you will find that message resonating with veterans groups now that they've seen firsthand. So what next? What can we do to continue moving the narrative around refugees in the right direction? The one thing I don't think people have focused on is what a tremendous asset all these Afghan evacuees are going to be to the United States. And, you know, we keep hearing in the news sort of negative things about immigration. You still sort of hear all that stuff. But we have a demographic crisis going on in America right now. And we have a tremendous labor shortage. We need smart, educated people with multiple language backgrounds who are going to work hard and make America a great place. Um, And it's always been the case that these refugee communities contribute to America in the long run. So I think people need to go back and look at the history and realize that when you have a large group of people that immigrate to America because they're fleeing a disaster or some terrible situation in their home country, they always end up contributing. They're always a net asset. As Margaret points out, a path to permanent status is a key to helping newcomers and the communities that welcome them thrive. I think it is doable. It just requires leadership and it requires people to pay attention to the reality on the ground, which is you don't want to have a bunch of people in the country that can't participate fully in our civic life. You want people to get green cards. You don't want them to have some kind of limbo status. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense, you know, for people to be always having to renew their work permit and, you know, not be able to get a driver's license and all the collateral consequences of not having a green card. Uh, it makes perfect sense to just give people a green card. You you add to your tax base, your labor force, you, you know, make it easy for people to work in our market system, our market economy. And, and it doesn't make sense to keep them in a limbo status. And if you watch what happened with all the Salvadorans who've been in TPS for years and years and years, you know, what a nightmare that's been. Uh, they should just give people green cards and call it a day. You know, it, it doesn't hurt our country to give lots of green cards out to people. You know, it's a net benefit. As Nadia Hashimi, an author whose parents immigrated from Afghanistan and who we're going to hear more from in the coming weeks, points out, this evacuation and resettlement has taken an immense emotional toll both on Afghans and veterans. We were getting emails from veterans who were just finding us and saying, how can I help? And I've been in rooms with um, with veterans organizations where they are mobilizing, I mean, beyond what anyone could possibly imagine. And I think that that, uh, you know, the group of veterans and, and from things that I've seen online, people kind of just sharing their experiences, family members of veterans. Um, this has been as hard as it's been on the Afghan community. I think it's been really devastating also on the, the community of veterans and their families. And it's... Uh, 
And one of the things that I think really needs to be addressed is, you know, the mental health of the veterans, because they are not grieving the loss of their homeland, but they're, I think, grieving um, a loss. the loss of a place that they really fought hard, that they gave a lot to help redirect in a way that they thought was meaningful, would be intentional, and would have enduring results. And um, and that's something that really needs to be acknowledged. And I think one yeah. thing that we can hopefully do is build some bridges between the veterans community and the newly arrived Afghans, because I think that's where really powerful, uh, lasting friendships can happen. Margaret Stock is an immigration attorney and retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve. Nazani Nash is the CEO of Welcome.us. Nadia Hashimi is a pediatrician, a novelist, and a member of the Welcome.us Coalition. You can learn more about their work on our website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. And if you like what you hear, subscribe to Only in America wherever you are listening to this episode. Only in America is produced and edited by Katie Lutz, Joanna Taylor, and Becca Wall. Our artwork and graphics are designed by Carla Leha. I'm Ali Nirani, and I will talk to you next week. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. And from Humanity United. When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity.